Hello, my name is Megan Jones. I'm Associate Professor of Art History at Alfred University. Welcome to Path of the T-Bowl Conference, day two. Yesterday, we heard about Song Dynasty Bowls and the T-Bowls by Otagaki Rangetsu and Tomioka Tessai and Haruko from the Johnson Museum. Uh, by the way, those, those bowls are now on view at the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum exhibition that you see in this image. This event is being recorded and we plan to make that available later on the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum's YouTube channel. A few words about participation. To communicate with others, click chat and type a message. The drop-down menu allows you to control who sees your message to either the panelists and hosts only or to everyone. As we did at the start of yesterday's session, please, if you wish, share in the chat where you're logging in from and your greetings. I know it's nighttime for those of you in East Asia and I thank you for joining us in whatever time zone you are in. To pose a question to a presenter or panel, type it in the chat or the Q&A. And to adjust the live transcript settings, click on that icon. Our first speaker in this session is Sun Young Sang. She's amongst a wonderful array of curators, scholars, and specialists, and Alfred Ceramic Art faculty who will be presenting today. As we go through each presentation, think of questions and please put them in the chat or the Q&A uh, as you listen to the presentations. We hope for lively dialogues at the end of each session. Dr. Sang is visiting researcher at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Her presentation is titled Cranes Soaring Among Clouds, the Appreciation of Gordio Saladon t balls Over to you, Dr. Sang. In this paper, I will talk about three topics. First, distinctive characteristics of corioteables with design of cranes and clouds, and how they were viewed and appreciated during the Korea period. And lastly, I will briefly talk about Japanese appreciation of corioteables. Next slide, please. First, let me briefly talk about Goryeo tea culture. The Goryeo dynasty, which runs from the 10th to the 14th centuries, was the most innovative and exciting period in Korean tea culture. The rise of Sun Buddhism and the development of tea drinking and cultivation went hand in hand during this time. Like its Chinese and Japanese counterparts, tea in Korea times was a religious and cultural commodity aesthetized by Buddhist monks and the nobility, who were the great patrons of tea drinking. However, it was not only Buddhist monks and monasteries that had a connection with tea at this time. Next slide, please. Tea was associated with both Buddhist and Taoist ideas and personality. And this was also the case in China since the Tang Dynasty. In Taoist thought, it was believed that drinking tea allowed one to become one with the way, to in Korean, the path to achieving a statement a, a state of enlightenment. This claim was made by many elite tea practitioners, such as the renowned Brittorat tea poet, Igubo, who wrote, quote, the taste of tea is the taste of the way, end quote. The popularity of the traditional motif of cranes and clouds increased in the Goryeo period, especially during the mid 11th, and 13th centuries, 
when Taoism, under the patronage of the royal court, exerted significant influence in Korea society and culture. Next slide, please. Because cranes and clouds are associated with Taoism and the immortals, they together serve as a symbol of longevity. The combination of cranes and clouds has deep roots in the East Asian art tradition, as evident from the wall paintings in the royal tombs that you see on the screen crane and cloud painting had already been established in China by the 10th century. Next slide, please. The robe retrieved from the 12th century Jin Dynasty tomb of the celebrated Taoist priest also has the motif of cranes and clouds. In Korea, the oldest works with decoration of cranes and cloth date back to the 5th century. The design of cranes and cloths on Goryeo Celadon was inspired by a number of sources, including Taoist and Buddhist ideas. Although Buddhism was a state religion during the Goryeo period, Taoism became a viable religious force under the patronage of the kings. For instance, King Yejong played an important role in fostering Taoism developed it in Northern Song. Next slide, please. The contemporary Northern Song Emperor, Hui Zhong, notorious for his devout belief in Taoism made this subject more popular. The hand scroll, Auspicious Cranes is one of the most famous paintings attributed to Huizhong. It is recorded that Huizhong's works was introduced to Koryo and highly admired during this time. Next slide, please. As a result, this period saw the flourishing of art and culture associated with both Buddhism and Taoism. The cranes and clouds were one of the most popular subjects in elite art during this time. In Taoism, the crane symbolizes longevity and serves as a means of transport to heaven. Next slide, please. In Buddhist thought, the crane was a metaphor for nirvana. For instance, the crane here is depicted in 16 meditations of the Visualization Sutra dated to 1300 uh, to convey wishes for the attainment of Nirvana. Next slide, please. The cranes and clouds appear on the Chinese Yato and Ding Wei as incised decoration in the Song Dynasty. And it is likely that they provided the pattern for design of cranes and clouds on Goryeo Celadon. However, all known Chinese examples with decoration of cranes and clouds are executed in the incising technique. Next slide, please. In contrast, on Goryeo Celadon, its design potential was fully exploited in a variety of decorative modes, ranging from iron painted patterns to inlaid decoration. Among them, the large quantities of the surviving tables have inlaid designs of cranes and clouds. Next slide, please. So let's take a close look. Here, the crane is inlaid with white, with black accents highlighting its beak and legs. The attraction of the inlay technique, known as sanggam in Korean, must have been its capacity of offering the ideal effect uh, for black and white contrast and precise definition. The inlay technique on Celadon was 
a uniquely Korean phenomenon in the 12th and 13th centuries. And this new decorative style reflects the taste of Goryeo as ruling class. Only Goryeo Celadon clearly demonstrates the influence of new Celadon technology from China. Subsequently, when the cultural exchange of Goryeo with the Southern Song Dynasty was not active in the mid 12th century, Goryeo potters developed a unique inlay technique to meet increasing demands for celadon. Next slide, please. Goryeo elite connoisseurs admired the color and designs of celadon balls suited to the tea's color and taste, especially inlaid celadon tea balls. For instance, a poem by Igubo, who I mentioned earlier, offers important evidence about tea drinking. It contains a fascinating description of pointing tea in a bowl with floral designs, which improves the color and taste of tea. This brief poetic vignette of tea drinking reveals how tea bowls held the limelight of the aesthetic enjoyment of tea, expressing a sense of artistic choice. Goryeo potters created celadon tea bowls in keeping with this prevailing tea ware taste. Next slide, please. Archaeological evidence supports that there, were, there was widespread appreciation of celadon tea balls with design of cranes and clouds among the Goryeo elite. The fact that top grade Goryeo celadon tea balls with this design were excavated from the tombs of the kings and the nobility and the sites of the leading Buddhist temple, temples indicates the high status of this type of bowls in the elite practice of tea drinking. Uh, for example, let us consider, uh, next slide please. Uh, let, let us consider um, the previous one, thank you. The, let us consider this tea bowl with decoration of cranes and claws and I'll talk briefly about the hist history of tea bowls in Korea. The Korea tea bowls used for serving whisk tea was mostly of a wide conical shape with a concave base and a small foot. And the average height is five to eight centimeters and the average diameter is uh, 10 to 18 centimeters. Uh, this conical shape permits easy per, uh, movement of a bamboo whisk to mix powdered tea with hot water within the bowl. Next slide, please. Such tea bowl's shape was inspired by the Chinese counterparts from the Yaozhou kilns of the Song Dynasty. Next slide, please. There were other types, uh, such as hemispheral shape that see you on the right, uh, with a small foot, which dates from the first half of the 14th century, and this it belongs to the last stage of Goryeo Celadon production. Next slide, please. As steep tea sur surpassed, powdered tea in popularity in the Joseon period, small teacups small, suitable for steep tea grew more fashionable among the tea participants and overshade uh, conical shaped tea bowls for serving powdered tea. Next slide, please. So what distinguish Goryeo tea bowls with design of cranes and claws from the Chinese counterpart is really essentially the use of the inlay technique. Uh, 
Here, the table is decorated both inside and out in the inlay technique. So when you get to drink uh, tea from this bowl, its full appreciation is revealed through drinking and handling it. Next slide, please. The inside is inlaid with four cranes in flight among clouds and a scroll wing border, all inlaid in white with details in black. The outside is inlaid in black and white slip with four chrysanthemum medallions. Uh, and chrysanthemums were also one of representative motifs on Cordocella Dome and these long lasting blooms symbolize longevity too. Next slide, please. We can extract valuable data about the, the appreciation of Koryo Celadon tea balls from surviving records. It seems that writing about the crane was quieter literati phenomenon during this time. The history of Koryo, Koryo Sa, records the poetry exchange between King Yejong and the scholar, official, and poet Park Yeo in 1116. Quote, white clouds formed in masses, and suddenly a pair of cranes appeared flying in the sky. The king gazed at them and asked Park Yeo to write a poem about this sight, and the king wrote a poem in return. End quote. In the same year, King Yejong bestowed tea to Kwagil to show grace and favor. Kwagil wrote a poem about it, and there he described tea as the dew supped by the Taoist immortals. This reflects a sense of sense that tea was considered as an exiler with the potential to bring health and longevity. Next slide, please. To understand the appreciation of tea balls, it is essential to consider how tea was consumed and how it was uh, appreciated during the Goryeo period. In Goryeo tea poetry, tea was often portrayed as a drink for nourishing life. And here, consider the term uh, chayak, meaning tea medicine. Both terms, tea and tea medicine, were used interchangeably during the Korea period. Next slide, please. Contemporary poets praise that tea could comfort and relieve them from various kinds of distress, such as thirst, fatigue, and sickness. In this light, it is not hard to imagine why the cranes and clouds, which were a symbol of longevity, were taken up as a major decorative motif on Goryeo Saladon tea balls. Next slide, please. So lastly, I will briefly talk about the Japanese appreciation of Goryeo Saladon. Goryeo Celadon had been imported into Japan as early as the mid 11th century. And please uh, have a look at the map of Japan here. We have archaeological finds of Goryeo Celadon in northern Kyushu, which is highlighted in yellow in this map. Uh, Kyushu uh, is the southwest of the mainland. Entering the 12th and 13th century, however, it was mainly Kyoto and Kamakura, which are highlighted in blue on the map, the centers of culture and politics for the imperial and samurai ruling classes, where Goryeo Celadon wares, especially of high quality works, were discovered. And there is a Japanese term, ungaku, for the cranes and clouds motif. Next, uh, next slide, please. It is worth noting that high esteem for Goryeo Celadon in Japan at this time has to do with 
uh, the Chinese enthusiasm for Choreoceladon as uh, the Song, Southern Song Dynasty scholar Taiping Laurian once praised the beauty of Choreoceladon, uh, the best under heaven. The 1975 discovery of the wreck of the Chinese trading ship in Xinan, uh, carrying a cargo of ceramics to Japan, shows us that Goryeo Celadon was one of highly valued imports at this time. This Chinese merchant vessel was on its way uh, to Japan from Port Ningbo to Port Hakata, but it never reached its destination destination. And please have a look at this map. Uh, this ship was uh, loaded with over 30,000 artifacts, including largely Chinese ceramics, but uh, it also had uh, included seven Goryeo Celadon wares. And I'm showing you two examples. Um, the ones uh, T-balls with decoration of cranes and clouds. So among various types, Celadon uh, decorated with inlaid motifs of cranes and clouds was one of the most popular types in Japan. And this map kind of shows interesting path of Korean tea bowls, first made in Korea and imported to China and later re-imported to Japan. Next slide, please. In the period from 1639 to 1718, made to order ceramics, so-called gohon, were produced in Korea solely for Japanese consumption. And they echoes the popular subject matter of cranes and clouds. But as you can see here in these two examples, the shape is not uh, conical. Uh, and the form is adjusted to the explicit taste of Japanese con customers. Next slide, please. The kiln was located in and outside the compound in Busan, uh, one of the major, major port cities in Korea. And next slide, please. The commission letters here that you see included illustrations of the ceramics with detailed information about the style, designs, and colors. In conclusion, the popularity of the cranes and clouds motifs on Goryeo Celadon corresponded with the spread of Taoism among the cultural elite circle during the 12th and 13th century. While inspired by contemporary, chi contemporary Chinese Celadon, Goryeo Celadon tables with design of cranes and clouds uh, embodied an innovative decorative techniques and achieved a high level of so sophistication. Appreciation of Goryeo Celadon went beyond geographical and temporal boundaries. Next slide, please. Continuous interest in Goryeo Celadon with design of cranes and clouds has left a trail of copies starting from the 17th century Gohon tables to the modern and contemporary revivals by Korean artists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sang. What an incredible set of images that ran the gamut from the Gordio dynasty to today. There's so much material to discuss. I'll be posing a, a couple of questions now and we can return to questions later at the panel discussion. The first question is from Barbara Ritchie. Can you kindly explain how the inlay technique was accomplished? Um. So uh, that is really a great question. Um, so um, the origin of the inlay technique on Celadon uh, in particular is still being debated in Korea, uh, where this technique was uh, first introduced and, uh, 
And um, so uh, there is no like consensus yet. Um, and uh, it seems like uh, it's likely that the technique itself was uh, first uh, introduced from China and uh, the Goryeo potters were sort of experimenting with this technique. Uh, but uh, at the beginning, they were not quite successful. So uh, that is why they were sort of uh, kind of, uh, even though it was uh, first introduced, uh, it seems like that uh, the technology, the technique was, brought uh, by the Chinese immigrant potters. Um, but uh, later the Korea potters were able to sort of uh, grasp and adjust. And uh, even though this inlay technique was first appeared on metal works and other um, uh, medium, uh, slowly uh, it was uh, used and uh, the Korea potters were able to achieve a level of sophistication on ceramics. Thank you. And then let's say tonight, uh, one of our studio potters joining wants to experiment with this technique called sangam in Korean, right? Sangam, yes. Sangam. They could take any sort of wooden or metal tool and incise the leather hard clay body, correct? And then apply white slip. Right, and also um, I, I know that there are some research on uh, the use of this inlay, uh, whether the Korea potters will actually use inlay or, uh, you know, like what these white and black pigments were made of. Mm. Uh, so these are very interesting and important questions that uh, I like to pose and I also like to learn from uh, the potters. Okay, there's a, a, a great question by a potter, Linda Sakura, but I wanna uh, go in order for the moment. Uh, Ai Fukunaga asks about occasions when uh, tea bowls were used. So she asks, was there any specific drinking occasion that the tea bowls with the design of cranes and clouds were chosen for in Korea, or were they used any time? So the tea bowls um, you showed with the crane and cloud motif specifically, does that relate to a particular occasion? Sure. Um, so. Um... For this uh, conference and for your exhibition, uh, I was asked if there were such a, you know, like ritual form of tea drinking in Korea. And uh, unfortunately, uh, little is known of Korea tea culture uh, due to the lack of uh, the surviving records. Um, however, um, in Korea tea poetry, uh, the the Korea we can uh, we can know we can uh, assume that uh, these uh, Korea celadon tea bowls were certainly um, the elite wares, and uh, they were commissioned by. Uh, the royal court and the nobility, and uh, there are no specific mention of the use of this type of tea bowls in any specific occasion, but uh, oftentimes Korea tea practitioners will drink a tea uh, in a sort of social gathering, or uh, they write a poem about uh, drinking tea in seclusion on the mountains. So mm. I think uh, you can guess that there are sort of various occasions where these Koryo tea uh, practitioners enjoy drinking tea from these very sort of sophisticated uh, Koryo tea bowls, but uh, it's very hard to actually know. Mm -hmm. 
We only have a couple minutes left. Uh, Linda Sikora's question may be a great one to return to during this, the discussion, but let me pose it uh, now and we can see where it goes. While the variation of clay body and celadon color may have been specific to geology, so in different regions, different uh, colors, for example, of the clay body and glazes. Uh, what about other things related to location, the motifs, the patterns, the banding of the form? How much did this vary the design according to the site where the bowls were made? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for uh, this and uh, raising this question. And um, so um, there are two sort of major centers of uh, Korea Celadon production. Um, and it is likely that uh, they sort of function as kind of the royal kilns. So the, so the, um, so the styles and design of these tables were uh, sort of uh, not too different uh, because uh, the commission was uh, given directly from uh, the royal court and the, the elite practitioners. Uh, however, uh, uh, over the course of uh, the development of Saladon production, there were some local uh, Saladon kilns that were making sort of low end uh, Saladon works. Uh, and that's when we get to see sort of various uh, variation uh, in uh, designs and styles, uh, but uh, the top quality works that were uh, meant for use for the state rituals or the elite drinking, uh, these were uh, 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 strictly monitored and uh, they were following uh, the sort of the standard. So they are quite uniform. Thank you so much. Uh, there was one question we didn't get to by Masako Sekimoto about contemporary Celadon, and that will be a great segue for our discussion that will involve contemporary tea bowls. So thank you so much, Dr. Sang. And we turn now to our next speaker. And I'm going to tee up our images here. Just a moment, please. <laughs> We're so pleased to welcome Akimoto Yuji, director of the Nerima Art Museum and professor emeritus at Tokyo University of the Arts. Yuji Akimoto is, is of course, the Western way of writing his name. Uh, his presentation title is A Free Mood Bowl That Represents, sorry, let me start over. A Free Mood Bowl That Reinterprets Tradition Through Subculture, manga, and anime points of view. Over to you, Professor Akimoto. Thank you very much for kind introduction of me. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today about the current state of contemporary Japanese craft and about tea balls in this conference. I'm very happy to be here. First, I would like to introduce myself and talk about my relationship with crafts. This is because uh, that story will later become the story of contemporary crafts and the tea ceremony, which I will talk about today, as well as the main theme, the tea ball. Next, please. Since the 19th, I have been working with architect and contemporary artist on Naoshima, an island in the Seto Inland Sea, on, the, on a project to turn the entire, entire island into a place, of, place for art, using the island's natural environment, which is uh, de designated as a nat national park, and the village that was formed in the 15th century. 
we have created architectural and site-specific artworks that trans transcend the conflict between local and global. Next, please. In 2007, I left Naoshima to become a director of the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art Kanazawa. Kanazawa is a city with a long history where the current city scope uh, current cityscape was formed in the 16th century. There too, I was involved in art activities that connected contemporary art and tra traditional culture. This is where craft became the link between traditional and contemporary culture for me. Kanazawa has the second largest number of traditional crafts after Kyoto and the tea ceremony is also very popular. In Kanazawa, there are 36 kinds of traditional crafts and about 100 tea houses. It is, it is a city where traditional culture is still alive and well in our daily lives. By making use of the cultural power of this city and promoting the modernization of crafts and art, we can form a rich urban culture. This activity has also pro provided an opportunity to gain a new perspective that goes beyond the old views of East and West, local and global, traditional and modern, which have often been problematic in the past. Next, please. Here are some examples so first is the work of several artists featured in the exhibition I organized in 2012, Japanese Craft Future Forward. The first is Masaya Mitsuke, an artist of Kutani Wear. Here is a view of the exhibition and the details of his work. His works are characterized by the novelty of using the traditional technique of Akai red painting, Yet the hand draw details looks like a computer generated line drawing. Next, please. The second artist is Yuki Hayama, an Arita porcelain artist, using images that have been pointed out to be related to the monster movie Godzilla and as a near future science fiction manga Akira. And the artist has created expressions that remind us of the end of the world. So next, please. The third artist is Noritake Tatehana. His representative work is a series of heel-rest shoes that became the talk of the town when Lady Gaga wear them at the concert. Tatehana's hero's shoes were inspired by the tall geta crocs who were worn by courtesans in the Edo period. Looking only at the eternal shape of the work and the way it is presented, its characteristics are closer to the contemporary art than to traditional craft which makes me want to point out its connection to contemporary art and design. In addition, the emphasis on concept and the method of uh, production that transcend, transcends genres are different from traditional crafts. At the same time, however, they show a uh, 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 obsession with classical subjects materials and the techniques than other artists and uh, poses them with more principle than the craftsmen. The image created a uh, diverse, pop, decorative, exciting, popular, sometimes childlike, sometimes simple and uh, concise in style. Unlike uh, previous approaches to the craft, they are flexible rather than having a uh, dualistic attitude of uh, obedience or rebellion to tradition. They are not afraid of tradition and they think freely. They do not, not think of craft only within craft. 
but freely combine craft techniques with other genres. Next, please. Now I would like to introduce a work related to the main topic, tea ball and contemporary art born from the reinterpretation of uh, tradition. The first person is uh, Takuro Kuwata. He's an artist who specializes in creating large sculptures over two meters in size and uh, placing them in a space for installation. As part of the Hokuriku Craft Festival, Gofokoge, Kuwata is displaying this work in the shrine, Otaki Shrine, based on ceramic techniques such as uh, kairagi, which, uh, which shrinks the surface of the work, and ishaze, which mixes stones and sand into the base material to expose the surface, as well as wabi-sabi and uh, hyoge, which are uh, unique aesthetic senses cultivated through the tea ceremony. Kuwata creates colorful and pop-like ceramic works and objects that fuse tradition and modern sensibilities. Next, please. What you are looking at now is a tea bowl. Kairagi and Ishaze are important aesthetics that convey the beauty of tea balls and pottery and are also standards of beauty that have grown up in the traditional tea ceremony in the first place. By cartoonish, cartoonishingly exaggerating the traditional beauty in the tea ceremony and expressing it with pop colors, Kuwata has created an expression that connect, connects the tea ceremony and tea uh, contemporary art. In Kuwata's seemingly free-spirited works, there are always re references to the aesthetics of ceramics and the tea ceremony, such as following the shape of a basel-shaped tea bowl. Next, please. The second artist is Yokamuta. What you are seeing now is an image of a frame of the exhibition at the Gofo Koge as well as Kuwata. And the two tea balls that she created at the hall of the Ota, Otaki Shrine. She did a large installation on the theme of horses, the vehicles of the gods. The head of the horse is made of porcelain which is combined with dyeing and weaving to make this work. Using animals and landscapes from mythology and folk tales as her subjects, such as dragons, king spirits, beasts, horses, and elephants. And she creates them with improvisational brush strokes and colorful depictions while referring to them. Her works are characterized by cartoon-like and cartoonish depictions of animals and people, which are related to subcultures such as anime and games, while at the same time referring classical mythology, postmodern attitude, this sense of uh, coexistence between the modern and the classical is something that other artists have in common. Next, please. The third artist, Kayoko Mizumoto, also works with the colored porcelain and object. What you are looking at now, uh, tea balls and uh, container. Mizumoto creates color paintings in the same way that she draws cartoons and illustrations. She develops uh, devilish, colorful, and uh, decorative expressions such as eyeballs, horns, and uh, frightening images to express her inner self. She also creates many mugs, teacups, platters, and bases. Next, please. 
The fourth art, this is Kim Ryu, who mainly creates, ra creates large objects and tea balls at the same time. Inspired by the armor and swords worn by samurai, his works are reminiscent of the outdoor aesthetic, aesthetic of the Edo period, Basara. There are also patterns from Jomon Asunwea, missile shapes, fins from all uh, air-cooled motorcycle engines, and other shapes that Kim likes to use to develop his own unique world of works. He also holds his own tea ceremonies and makes new proposals for the modern tea ceremony. Lastly, I would like to introduce some new aesthetic endeavors relation to the tea ceremony. In the following are two rooms. Next, please. The first is a work called Yuragino Tea House. Tea House of Fluxation installed in the Humboldt, Humboldt Forum of National Museum Asian Art in Berlin. For several years now, I have been conducting a study group entitled Craft Architecture with Artists and Architects on the theme of revaluating re 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 crafts and craftsmanship and uh, converting them into architecture. This is the uh, Yuragino Tea House, the result of the study group. The tea house made of metal, ceramics, and rapka was completed by the Ura Architectural Institute. Next, please. The last is a grass tea house. Mondrian, designed by contemporary artist Hiroshi Sugimoto. The grass tea room Mondrian was inspired by the intimacy of Sen Norikyu, Taiyan, a masterpiece of Wabi Cha a tea room. The uh, partition reminiscent of Mondrian's abstract, abstract paintings and the uh, delicate hand, handling of rice. It is a cube, cube made entirely of grass with two tatami mats on the floor. The name Mondrian comes from the Chinese character for a place to listen to the boss. But it is clear from the sound of the name that, is, that it is a reference to Mondrian, one of the most famous abstract, abstract painters of the 20th century. Sugimoto's unique flair for staging encounters between the West and the West, uh, West and the East, or between the classical and the contemporary, can be seen in this work. The tea house, which has uh, towards the Venice Biennale of architecture, the Palace of uh, uh, the Palace in, Pari uh, in Paris. Uh, Versailles and Kyoto uh, will be installed in Naoshima. I have, I have talked up, uh, not only about tea balls, but also about the exchange between contemporary art and craft, which has been showing active movement recently. At the end, I also touched on the tea room, an important element for the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony is a comprehensive art form that includes the tea ball, painting, architecture, and garden. At the same time, it is a way of tracing the events that happen in our lives in general, such as eating, drinking, drinking tea, talking with friends, and thinking from an artistic perspective in order to review our lives and improve the quality of our lives. Tea balls, tea rooms, and uh, gardens are all in interconnected each other. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Professor Akimoto. This was 
uh, a, a, an amazing series of images and thoughts. You concluded with, uh, I think, a great launch pad for us to be discussing a number of things. Uh, we have a question from Ai Fukunaga. Hmm. And her question has to do with one I was wondering if you could talk about as well, and that is regarding use, using tables. Mm -hmm. She asks, are Takuro Kuwata and Muta Yoko's tables actually used in tea gatherings, Chanoyu? They seem to be difficult to drink from. What is the relationship between contemporary pop tea bowls mm -hmm and tea practitioners in Japan. Yeah, sometimes the discussion about the using of tea wall uh, or artworks, art object. Yeah, but uh, the Kuwata and the Muta uh, uh, created the, the tea balls as well as uh, uh, objects, art object, both. They take care of two aesthetics, and sometimes uh, uh, we drink uh, uh, tea balls uh, made uh, by them uh, in a tea ceremony. And uh, uh, the, how do we think about uh, uh, use in the tea ceremony? Uh, the drinking is... Uh, uh yes uh, the tea bowl is uh, for drinking tea <laughs> but as uh, in other hand we uh, try to understand the beauty of uh, uh, tea bowls and uh, like a uh, artwork uh, seeing like uh, artworks yeah uh, so the, they they take care of uh, both uh, aesthetics yeah I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, in the Path of the Tea Bowl exhibition, there is a Kuwata Takuro Tea Bowl on view on loan from the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And it, it looks to be usable. Mm. <laughs> it's very yeah. large. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But well, it doesn't yeah. have a crack in the middle. For mm. example, the Peter mm. Volkus Tea Bowl that's a few feet away from it has a large crack in the middle. But uh, that's not the case for the Kuwata bowl. So I think that may be a question coming up later mm. in our in our discussions today. Uh, a question from Sol Jung. Have any of these contemporary tea bowls been used in traditional tea rooms? So the setting of, of use. So for example, if do you know any instances of a kuwata chawan being used oh. i don't know in an urasenke gathering um, or something yeah, like that uh, yeah the very famous tea master uh, uh recently he, he he passed away seizo uh, hayashiya uh, uh, he is a, a, a he sometimes uh, used uh, uh, Kuwata's tea balls in uh, uh, not traditional tea ceremony, but uh, he, he tried to modernize the uh, uh, traditional way. So sometimes he uh, uh, used uh, the contemporary tea ball to make the friction uh, between tradition and contemporary aesthetic, yeah. Thank you. Friction yeah. <laughs> is a great <laughs> keyword, friction. <laughs> uh, a related question uh, by Priscilla Vasquez Rilova. She writes, good day, professor. I would like to ask how well accepted are all these new ways of art in Japan. And then how about in the Rikyu schools? Hmm. <laughs> uh, 
you know, the, now uh, uh, the the new uh, new group uh, uh, show up, and the, oh, but uh, yeah, the uh, I show the tea rooms uh, in uh, located uh, in Berlin. Uh, it's uh, supervised by Rasenke. Uh, as you know, the, the biggest uh, tea groups uh, and the master of Rasenke uh, 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 give, gave uh, advice to make uh, contemporary tea rooms. And uh, I think the contemporary craft group and the traditional a group uh, uh, making a good relation to create a new new world. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Is that a, a, a new one? world again? Another, <laughs> another set of keywords we can uh, take with us and 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 let those linger for a bit. A new world. Linda Sakura, who is a professor of ceramic art at Alfred asks, how accessible is the island with the site-specific work? How does one visit the ah, island? Naoshima? I think she's Naoshima. talking about Naoshima. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, yeah uh, the, from uh, Honshu, the mainland, to the island, there is a ship. So you can get, get, to the, get by the boat. Yeah, it's not... Uh, it's not easy, but uh, you can reach there. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Linda, for that question. I don't see any other questions in the chat or the Q&A. If you have one, now's your time. We do have a, a couple more minutes. Ah, okay. A good question from Joel Stewart. What is the experience of the tea ceremony, Chanoyu, Inside oh. Sugimoto's glass tea room, oh. what does it feel like? <laughs> it's a very, it says a it is question. so exposed to the outside, mm -hmm. the complete mm -hmm. opposite, yeah, yeah, of a traditional private, yeah, tea room. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, completely uh, opposite from the Saint Norikyu's uh, uh, beauty aesthetic. Yeah, this is the idea. Uh, Mr. Sugimoto wanted to uh, wanted to uh, the uh, the wabi sabi cha uh, the the uh, is uh, the uh, it's a little <laughs> bit uh, uh, difficult to explain about the uh, wabi sabi aesthetic, uh, but. Uh, uh, Yeah, the the can I uh, when I uh, ex experience uh, uh, tea rooms tea room by Sugimoto, it's uh, there are all grasses uh, surrounded me, but uh, it's uh, transparency. We can see everything, but the in the other hand. It, Grass, uh, it's a, t a transparency, but uh, it exists. So we feel, how do I say, the material of grass. So we can see everything, but uh, we get into the small world. Share the master, uh, the, 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 uh, share the, how do I say, the, yeah, it, it's transparency, but uh, in the other hand, we exist in the small uh, world. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A follow up question <laughs> from yeah. James Henry Holland, <laughs> our colleague just up the road in Geneva, mm -hmm. New York. He asks Is the glass tea room mm -hmm. ventilated 
<laughs> this 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 could be a COVID specific kind of question, but I think he means uh, how how much fresh air comes in. Do you ah you know? Yeah, yeah. There are some of the small holes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's no problem to <laughs> get air. Get air. Yeah. That's good to know. One imagines a steamy room filled with hot tea. <laughs> People talking. Oh, it could oh. it could steam up. Maybe that's what he's uh, oh, yeah, imagining. Yeah, yeah. That could be quite yeah. uh, atmospheric. Uh, Linda Sakura writes spectacle comes to mind with that yeah. question. Yeah. Rina Bessa writes, it's a beautiful way to share with people mm. a tea ceremony. The, the tea room by Sugimoto's uh, yeah. will be installed in Naoshima uh, next year. So the, yeah, the visitor can experience, experience it. Yeah, yeah, the next year. Fantastic. I, I hope we can all go and see it. That would be amazing. Andrew Maskey yeah. writes, I suspect Riku would have been excited mm. at the prospect of creating a glass tea room. After all, he made a golden tea room. Uh, for yeah, Adrian that's right. Hideyoshi. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think that's a, a, a great comment to and on, oh, there's one more question that, that came in. I think we have time for one more. So very fast mm -hmm. from Randall Weingarten. Do you feel, Professor, that this creative relationship of ancient and mo modern mm. is redefining our sense of beauty? And actually, yeah, it looks like it's Tandel yeah. Weingarten posing the question. Mm. Ancient to modern, is that redefining how people today think of beauty. That's, mm. a, that's a large question, but maybe one <laughs> we want to kind of let sink in for a moment. Kodai to kindai no relationship. Yeah, it's a, it's a very big question. And, uh, but uh, the contemporary artist and the uh, uh, craftsman try to uh, engage uh, between classic and uh, contemporary. Uh, yeah, this is a dream. It's not the easy way to make uh, links, uh, both of them, but uh, they try, yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, you know the, we have a uh, friction between it, but uh, <laughs> they want to, interpret uh, in the another way, yeah. This is the, I think the possibility uh, to understand the, uh, uh, another possibility to understand the classical culture, yeah. In a, yeah. Indeed, thank you so much. I think it's now past 10 p.m over in Tokyo. So I appreciate uh, everyone's participation from various points in different time zones. So it's my pleasure now to move to our next speaker and all of our uh, panel speakers from this morning's session will be returning for some discussion uh, at the end after this next presentation. Dr. Shinya Maezaki is professor of art history at Kyoto Women's University. And the title of his presentation is The History of Tea Bowls from the Perspective of Supply and Demand. Thank you, Maizaki Sensei. Can I start? Please, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind of introduction. My name is Shinya Maizaki. I now teach history of Japanese culture, art and design at Kyoto Women's University. It is my pleasure to be able to join this fantastic opportunity to share our thoughts on tea ball and tea culture. Next, please. A potter and my good friend Matsubayashi Hosa at the 16th once told me that when throwing a tea ball on the potter's wheel, he spends most of the time looking at the inside to create the shape. This is because the interior is most important in highlighting the deep green of the tea. 
The exterior is only the result of the inside having been carefully crafted. However, when talking about tea bowl as an art object, people rely on photographs of the outside of bowls, thereby focusing primarily on the exteriors. Next, please. For this presentation, I would like to touch on the history of the inside of the Japanese tea bowl, which is usually overlooked. It is natural that domestic production is stimulated by trends of tea utensil styles and increases in demand. Tea bowls cannot exist until there are people who want to use them to make matcha. The historical flow of tea bowl supply and demand reveals the importance of a topic not widely discussed the inside of tea bowls. Next, please. Although many theories around regarding the time when tea was introduced to Japan from China, it is generally accepted that the Japanese began drinking tea with Chowan during the Tamakura period. Next, please. It was brought to Japan from China by foreign Buddhist monks or Japanese monks who traveled to China for training and later became favored by the ruling class, that is the samurai and court nobles, after its use became common at Zen temples. Next, please. Its popularity due to caffeine was even documented by Zen Buddhist monk Yosa in his Kissa Yojoki, How to Stay Healthy by Drinking Tea, first published in 1211, that the good point about tea is to stop people from sleeping. It must have been very useful for monks who practice strict trainings. Next, please. Around that time, Chinese made tenmoku and celadon tea bowls were mainly used. And the reason was simple. The Japanese were unable to produce such high quality ceramic wares. For that reason, bowls for drinking tea imported from China became fundamental for a long period of time. This changed, however, during the time of Murata Shuko and Sen no Rikyu, the introduction of Wabicha. Next, please. After the time of Rikyu, no longer were Chinese tea bowls were, uh, the only types of tea bowls used. Korean and Japanese tea bowls, such as Raku, were able uh, were, were also added to the variety. Also, if we look at the Chinese tea bowls, such as the type known in Japan as Shuko Seiji, used during this time, we can see that the quality had clearly degraded. Next, please. One can consider this to be one due to the introduction of wabi tea or the change in the taste unique to Japanese, or two, the result of the low purchasing power of the Japanese, or three, linked to the efforts by the merchants involved in tra trading the ceramic wares. Although emphasis has hitherto been given to the first explanation, it is perhaps easier to understand the change also with the latter two explanations. Next, please. Also, the interior decoration became wabicha, uh, before wabicha, gold was very important materials for decoration. The clay walls of Japanese houses are brown, and so inside of large buildings are dark and gold were used to amplify the lights coming through windows or from candles and lamps. If not decorated with gold, the space were, uh, even, uh, the space were larger and the important expensive and rare Chinese items are displayed on the shelves to show wealth of the owner. However, it changed when Ricky introduced tea house of much smaller space with simple and rustic interiors. The, this matches the newly introduced rustic Chinese, Korean, Japanese tea bowls. Next, please. Being considered the beginning of this wabicha or wabi tea, and observing from the perspective of global ceramic trading history, this change can be seen as the transition in which Japan sifted from imported high-grade Chinese tea bowls in favor of inferior Chinese and Korean tea bowls. This change occurred when Romaji Shogunate faced the financial crisis and led to the Onin War, 1467 to 1477, then to the Sengoku period, the Warring State period. In other words, Japan probably did not have power to access to purchase the very best Chinese ceramic wares in the international market any longer. Korean tea bowls could have been chosen as a substitute. Also, once Japanese potters could produce tea wares of acceptable quality, 
Riku and his followers turned their attention to Japanese ones too. All this change has been explained using the word wabi-sabi, as if Japanese suddenly had a new and distinctive taste in tea drinking practices, but it could have been just an excuse not being able to buy good Chinese ceramic wares anymore. Next, Edo period. This trend would be further promoted by the Japanese shogunate government's control over foreign trade under the Sengok, uh, Sakoku or national isolation policy introduced in the early Edo period. The Japanese, uh, the tea balls imported to Japan became mostly deftware from the Netherlands and coarse Chinese wares and some stonewares from Southeast Asia. Not only were renowned tea balls used by Senno Rikyu and before his time rare, tea implements were also susceptible to damage during use. To fill in the void left by this, kilns for firing tea implements became necessary. For example, Kyoto's artisans of ceramic wares such as Ninsei and Raku continued to propose the creation of new implements. Though this only became fully established among the ruling class after the samurai families had acquired a taste for tea ceremony and which led to the continual demand for tea ceremony implements. Next, please. When we talk about ceremony, a tea ceremony during the Edo period, it is important to bear in mind that Sensko, Omote Senke, Ura Senke, Mishana Koji Senke, which is a very famous now, were not the mainstream. It was Oribe school, Kobori school, and Sekishu school that are often described as Buke Sado, warrior's tea. Tea ceremony became one of the basic practices for warriors. Especially the Sekishu school was popular among daimyo or feudal lords. Katakiri Sekishu was the tea trainer for fourth shogun Tokugawa Ietsuna. He introduced a license system to become a tea master while other schools took the system that only the children of tea masters can take over the headship of the school. Some 250 or more domains with feudal laws existed and many of them preferred to have their own schools rather than stay being some uh, tea master student. Next, please. During the latter part of the period, the Kansai-born enjoyment of clear central tea brewed using the Kyusu teapot spread nationwide. So did the con conventional tea ceremony fall into a uh, gradual decline? I do not so much time to talk about Sencha today, but we know that many late Edo Japanese artists such as Ito Jakuchu, Yosabu Son, Ike no Taiga, Uragami Yokudo, Tanomura Chikuzen, and many other literary painters practiced, practiced Sencha, not Matcha. Next, please. And Kyoto uh, and next, please. <laughs> And Kyoto potters such as Kiyomizu Rokube I, Ninami Dohachi, and Aoki Mokube were specialized sencho ware makers. Also, Wazen and Hozen of the Eiraku Zengoro family, who are now known as one of the 10 artisans families produced tea wares for Sen family, Senke Jishoku, mainly produced sencho utensils at the time. Next, please. The popularity of sencha in the 19th century could be seen from the case of Seiwan Chakai, a sencha tea gathering held in Osaka in 1862. 1,200 people participated in the event and could drink tea. Uh, other few thousand people came but couldn't drink tea because there are just too many people. I'm showing the record of the event. Next, Meiji period. With the downfall of the samurai class as a result of the abolition of domains and the establishment of prefectures at, at the start of the Meiji period, the survivor of tea ceremony was hanging by a thread. This is the list of ceramic kilns operated in Japan in 1890, and there are about 312 kilns listed. Many of these kilns used to produce tea wares for the samurai. Some kilns were closed for good, and the other sifted produced sencha wares or industrial ceramic wares such as bricks, tiles, or pipes for water supply. Next, please. Kyoto Pota Mashimizu Zoruk II later described the time as Japanese, a quote, Japanese traditional culture turned upside down and owning collections of antique wares were considered as shameful act. And there are no people buying antique wares, but only selling them until 1873. End quote. Next, please. 
It was government hired foreigners who arrived in Japan in early Meiji period, who were the only ones that showed interest in tea ceremony implements at the time, which plenty of people were selling, but no buyers. Particularly in the case of Edward Sylvester Morse, he collected many highly appreciated tea ceremony implements and brought them back to the United States with him. It is conceivable that the plummeting prices of tea, uh, tea ceremony implements that once were traded at high prices would have continued, uh, it had contributed Morse's ability to collect some 6,000 or more ceramic items within three years during his stay in Japan. Next, please. It was not until the middle of Meiji period that tea ceremony was revived. This was the result of tea ceremony being introduced to the world, world as one of the cultures representing Japan by Japanese people who understood the value of things Japanese whilst participating at such event as the World Exposition. It is interesting that sencha was much more popular in Japan at the time, but it was not introduced as the Japanese tea culture. It is probably because tea brewed with teapot was considered Chinese. Although the whisk, uh, whisked in a tea bowl was a culture also brought from China, the Chinese people did not do it anymore and Japanese took an advantage from it. Also, something else would take place uh, along with the establishment of tea ceremony as part of Japan's national identity. Next, please. That was the beginning of the collection of historical implements by emerging businessmen such as Masuda Takashi, who had turned their attention to tea ceremony as a business tool. The ceremonies began, uh, ceremony began being used to entertain clients, and it is being invited to a tea ceremony organized by people like Masuda, extremely successful entrepreneur, who became synonymous with the prestige of any businessman. Next, please. And uh, Master Takashi was very famous for a patron uh, for the Omote Senke uh, school. From the end of Meiji period, the appreciation for tea ceremony would gradually gain prominence. The exhibition Hatakeyama Kinenka no Meihin, masterpieces from the Hatakeyama Memorial Museum of Fine Art, currently exhibited at the Kyoto National Museum, is showing the collection created by Hatakeyama Issei who is one of the representative figure in this new phenomenon. He was a founder of Evera Corporation, leading water pump company and the well-known skisha or tea ceremony master. Next, please. It is likely that popularization of tea enjoyment by such modern skisha or tea ceremony masters overlapped with the timing of the selling of, of collections of tea ceremony implements kept by the samurai class as they gradually became further impoverished after the abolition of domains and establishment of prefectures. With the fever to collect these items heightening, many renowned pieces left their storage of samurai families and became available for purchase on the market. Between the Taisho period and the pre-war period, items in the collection of the former Edo era ruling families, such as daimyo families, were sold off one after another falling subsequently into the hands of emerging businessmen who rushed to purchase them. Next, please. This led to the rediscovery of Rimpa and Nonomura Ninsei uh, because they suddenly came out from the storages of the old fam samurai families and their works were simultaneously inserted into the history of Japanese art. Meanwhile, this led to the shortage of tea ceremony implements as existing pieces could not satisfy the demand. Consequently, more and more ceramic artisans began creating tea bowls again from around the end of the Meiji period. Next, please. This is the magazine article talking about the rapid price increase of rackware. It explains that it is understandable if the old rackwares by the famous old masters were expensive, but it's unbelievable that new rackware just came out from the kiln by the current master is now so expensive. And the, uh, the, the article is dated in 1919. Next, please. After the World War II, the widespread of Urasenke style tea ceremony enjoyed by women gave rise to the mass production of tea bowls. 
The fact that businessmen practiced tea ceremony meant that the women who cared for the family were also expected to be versed in tea ceremony. This led to the creation of tea ceremony clubs at school nationwide, while tea ceremony classes for the general public also increased year after year. The photograph is the tea ceremony club from my university. There you have no school, not Urasenke, but wanted, uh, wanted to show, I wanted to show you that it is difficult to find the university not having tea ceremony club and most clubs belong to Urasenke school. And immediately after the war, the Rosenke school also set up classes overseas and helped to popularize tea ceremony. The spread of tea ceremony practice and the enjoyment thus required a large quantity of tea bowls for practice use. And so tea bowls created by famous ceramic art artists were in demand, to say the least, for tea ceremony enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people. Next, please. However, one sport could begin to gain popularity after the war and threaten the popularity of tea ceremony regarded by businessmen as a business tool. That sport was golf. Like tea ceremony, because golf also facilitated spending long periods of time with a few people, it became popular in no time. Next, please. In addition, businessmen began spending less on expensive art, partly because of the high inheritance tax. Today, ceramic artists are clinging on to a few remaining tea ceremony enthusiasts of the previous generation for survival. In particular, the number of people who appreciate tea ceremony between the teens and 20s continues to decrease, with no signs of discovery in the future. So if we look at the perspective of demand and supply of tea bowls, we can see that ceramic making has been a form of production industry. The more people desire to enjoy matcha tea, the more necessary implements are made. And when tea ceremony as a culture falls into decline, it leaves the people create, creating tea bowls in a predicament. The chart shows the number of Japanese people whose hobby is tea ceremony. From the left uh, to the right, the year 1996, 2001, 2006, 2011 and 2016. An orange bar is male and gray bar is, gray bar is female. You can see the number continues to decline. With very few excep exceptions, ceramic artists of the 20th century created works that resemble tea bowls. These are made to satisfy high demand and were guaranteed to sell. If an artist's work became recognized and appreciated, where he or she would be able to live on only making and selling tea bowls. On the other hand, if the, if the demand dies out, the number of people creating tea bowls decreases since nothing they, uh, they make would be sold. Next, please. Japan's history of tea ceremony implements has been a repetition of such rise and fall. Each time had different reasons for, ri for the rise. It was stimulant to help monks training then a basic practice training by warriors class, or for warriors class, one of the symbols of Japanese culture, a business tool for new rich, one of bright trainings for young women. It is a fantastic thing that there are many well-known scholars participating in this conference discussing about the tea and tea bowls. However, today, there are a few ceramic artists specializing in making tea bowls doing well, including my friend Matsubashi Hosai the 16th, and I hope that there is another good reason to make the Japanese tea ceremony revive again in the near future. That's all from me today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maizaki Sensei. Woo! What a journey from the Kamakura period, <laughs> yes. eh? covering so much in 20 minutes. I know. And I yeah, think but the thing is, time. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, but uh, the thing is, like, you know, there's no literature. I'm writing about this in English, I think. So I, I just wanted to put everything in. Hope that made sense. You've Hope shared sense. so much. And I remember the conversation that we had in your car in Kyoto mm -hmm. when Wayne Higby was visiting. And this was in 2017. And I was in Kyoto to research tea. And you talked to us about the rise of Wabi that we might really, really need to, in scholarship, <laughs> look at more closely in terms of the social 
and military and economic contexts of the late 15th century. Um, uh, Wayne has ha, writes a comment, wonderful addition to our deliberations, Professor Shinya Maizaki, as you have filled you. important gaps in the rise of the global interest in the Japanese tea ceremony. Other questions for Professor Maizaki? Yes. Because I know I can ask several, but I want to hear from you. Karina Bessa asks, mm -hmm. in traditional Japanese, oh, it's a comment. In traditional Japanese shops like kimono and teaware shops, the practice of talking and drinking tea before doing business still holds. Do you want to comment on that comment? That's good. Sorry, could you, could you say it again? Uh, in I traditional guess. Japanese shops, the mm -hmm. practice of talking and drinking tea before doing business mm -hmm. remains today. Yes, but uh, it's now becoming rare and rare if, uh, to, to have the, the whiskey tea served. Now it's often the tea coming from the teapot. <laughs> so that's also again saying that, you know, are we really having the tea making tea bowl as a Japanese culture, because you know, maybe one in hundred people, or maybe one in thousand people can make it. But we still believe that um, this is the most one of the most important Japanese culture. <laughs> and it's a kind of funny uh, concept, I think. But uh, yes, uh, there are uh, shops that serve uh, tea, but you know, the whisk tea is becoming rare and rarer. Indeed, and that graph you showed was really, really interesting in documenting the decline, as you say, of, of Chawan usage in Japan. I think there's an assumption outside of Japan that Japan is the center for Chawan production. Would you, would you agree that it still holds that status, even if the use of the Chawan or yes. the purchase of the Chawan okay. is being eclipsed by golf? <laughs> <laughs> yes now it's sauna but you know i don't want to talk about it but, um, um well you yeah, mentioned the uh, sauna now so do you want to say something no about i don't that? want to want to talk about sauna because it's going to be a long story but you know the people now st stop playing golf and now the rich young japanese people started to go to sauna and then after the sauna they put they are put into a small room and then they talk about the business so now it's the, the latest trend so the the thing is like you know Jap what 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 always the same thing is that you know the rich young male business people put together right and this is the most important kind of activity for japanese culture and then the tea or the go or sauna is just just an activity surrounding them so, so I think, you know, sauna, you don't need anything, right? So the, the problem is like, it, it doesn't actually create new cultures. So I was just hoping that there's something else that, you know, can de I want to make them spend money on something, you know? <laughs> if it's tea ceremony, they have to spend money on the tea bowl, then it creates a new culture. But now nobody's buying uh, tea bowls because um, they don't do teas. Um, few, the few people buying it because they, there are few people buying it because they want to display it in the in the rooms, but not for using them. And very few people use the uh, the contemporary uh, tea bowls. Uh, I think that's the, that's the problem. Of course, there are new um, tea masters, uh, younger ones like you know my age, and they try to use the the new tea bowls like you know Akiyama just said, um, but it's very rare um, and so it, it, it seems like you know lots of things going on but it's not really is the, is, the, is the answer I think. Thank you. I was wondering if you could take us back a little bit in more detail to the late 15th century mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Wabi. There's <laughs> okay. a tremendous usage of Wabi in North America going to the ceramics studios at Alfred. And everybody is not sure district. about that, right? Yeah. What's that? Sorry. Everybody is not sure about what it means, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so what you've just shared is very important, I think, for listeners around the world to, mm -hmm. to understand. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the okay. definition um, of Wabi um, and, and I, why it developed when it did? I, 
um, the first thing is like I did my master's in Chinese ceramics and I did my PhD in Japanese ceramics. And then the first thing was kind of very, seems weird to me is like um, the, before Rikyu, um, Japanese people are using like quite good ceramic wares. <laughs> but after Rikyu or Shuko, suddenly the, 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 the wares that Japanese people using becomes like some, it, 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 I mean, it becomes cheaper, right? <laughs> On the international market. Because so these, these types of wares do not appear in the history of Chinese porcelain or ceramics because it's, it's lesser grade uh, for Chinese people. But somehow Japanese says that we, we loved it because we, are dis we have distinctive style. And so we collected it and it's very Japanese, you know. But this type of story was actually reinforced, I think, the, in the Meiji to the Showa period, especially after the World War II, that when the Urasenke started to produce the textbook of the um, tea ceremony, because you know, they, they made so many branches uh, of the Urasenke school in Japan, all over Japan. And in order to uh, standardize the level of the education, they needed the textbook. So they created the company called Tankosha. It's the publishing company, uh, you know, they're founded by the Urasenke and they published so many textbooks. And the, the, when they publish the textbook, they have to create the story. So um, when they did that, of course, for example, they didn't write about the Sencha and then, and then you know, the hardship they had in the Meiji period. So it was like erased the history. And then you know, they created what the Wabi Sabi is, you know, the concept that you know, Japanese people always like this type of stuff, right? But they never talk about how the world outside of the world was doing, you know, what was the good or expensive ceramics at the time in China was, you know, they don't talk about that. And, and, and at the time, the, uh, because and at the end of the Meiji period, Japanese entrepreneur like Mazda Takashi or all these businessmen actually could buy the good stuff too. So they are mixing the very good Chinese porcelain or Chinese ceramics into the very old Japanese ceramics or very old ceramics. Uh, Chinese ceramics was always holded by the Japanese uh, rich people in the Edo period. And they put everything in the mix and then they made a new concept of you know, wabi-sabi. So, so I just forget everything about it and then just went back to the 15th century and I just look at the ceramics that they used or you know, we, we kind of know that what they used. And then most of them suddenly became cheaper. And it was about the time that all new war and then you know, Kyoto having a bad time and you know, the, the, the country itself is kind of in a financial crisis. And of course we can't really buy the good stuff. It's, it's easy explanation to me, but you know, nobody knows because you know, there's no record or, or whatever. So it's just a um, type of myth, but I think that you know, it's, it's kind of the possible um, idea. <laughs> Thank you, indeed. We've got uh, one question from Taka Oshikiri that I'll ask and then we'll move to a discussion period with all our panelists. Urasenke has been publishing journals since the beginning of the 20th century. Do you think their discourse changed before and after World War II? Uh, not really, but you know, the, the, I think a bit sad thing about for them is like, you know, they were like forced to create the entire history of tea because the other schools like sexual school, as I said, that, you know, uh, in the Edo period, you know, everybody's doing sexual school. But in the secondary school was, you know, um, disappeared after the, you know, major restoration because, you know, their their fans or you know their students are all warriors and the warriors lost their jobs and they they became a no one, so they suddenly lost all the all the students, and they're still there um, in the in the IT prefecture. There are some secondary schools still left, but you know they became very minor uh, schools. So in you know order, but you know, Urasenke was kind of um, expected to write all the history of of Tizen because they are the only people who had the published publishing companies, and then and they are, it was supported by the the scholars in Kyoto. 
and, and you know, they, they have to write the history of tea, entire tea, but they couldn't really write the real story about the Sencha or about the Sekishu. And so they kind of got omitted, uh, you know, some of the stories from the history. And that was translated into English. So the, the your literature often do not have the Sekishu or Sencha or many of them. So I think that's the problem. And we would like to rewrite it, but um, it's so difficult now because you know, people kind of believe this you know, created history. So that's, 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 that's my idea. Thank you. We'll move now to our panel discussion. We've got okay. until 10.15 AM Eastern time for this. So we'll bring back Professor Akimoto and Dr. Sang, and let's see, we're here. Wonderful. Hey, yes, everybody's here. <laughs> We've got some really outstanding questions in the Q&A and chat. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions or comments for each other now that you've heard the presentations? And I think we can identify I, I several question. things. I have a question for uh, Sanyon. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know that you know uh, Kodaiki or Yatsuraiki. There are uh, people in Japan making the ceramics in the style of um, Korea, Co Co Korean Korean ware. And I was wondering if you have any comments on their works. I, I'm going to um, share the, uh, I have um, created, oh, sorry. I have created um, a Google Arts and Culture exhibition um, I'm gonna show you, um, that's the link. And if you go there, um, sure. there are Japanese type of uh, Korean inlay where there are still people making them. And I was just wondering <laughs> if you have any oh, comments yeah, on that. Yeah. I would like to uh, take a look at them. Actually, I, I haven't, uh, this is great. So, uh, there will be an exhibition dedicated to these artists who are reviving the tradition of... Yeah, it is a, it's a traditional um, artist. Um, their uh, ancestors were, uh, came back uh, from, uh, came to Japan from Korea when Japan kind of, you know, oh. um, invaded, not really invaded, but, you know, <laughs> but, but their <laughs> ancestor was... Uh, right made a friend with the uh, warrior and then they are happily came to uh, this area but um <laughs> yeah korean immigrants potters yes uh, yes yes right um well in fact um i'm also like currently curating i mean you you like I, I, I introduced you briefly. I'm also organizing the online exhibition, mm -hmm. uh, which is about the impact of the Imjin War uh, and the major ceramic industries in Kyushu. And uh, one of the things that uh, I would like to highlight in this exhibition uh, is that uh, when these Korean potters were brought to certain parts of Japan mm. after the war, what they were uh, instructed or what they were asked to produce in Japan were not necessarily the replication of Korean ceramics. Mm. They were like totally different because uh, in Japan, they mm -hmm. have new patrons, right? So they were sort of adopting certain elements of Korean ceramic tradition, mm -hmm. uh, such as Goryeo Celadon, which they were not necessarily familiar with because Joseon uh, mm -hmm. Korean potters, they were making, you know, in the uh, 16th, 17th century, they were making already porcelain, right? Uh, the Celadon tradition was already gone by then, mm -hmm. but, um, the, the big question is then how they were able to make those celadons or the types of wares that were completely forgotten in the Joseon period. But like in Japan, these were the handed down tea balls that were still highly valued and treasured. So, so there are some theories as to how these Korean immigrant supporters were able to produce these 
Korean tea balls. And one theory is that um, uh, they were able to see uh, some of the these uh, handed down tea balls and were able to like copy. But um, I think uh, this all again goes down to the question of the transfer of ceramic technology, because uh, if you are specialized in say porcelain, um, how you were able to actually uh, employ a totally different ceramic technology just by looking at celadon. Mm -hmm. I think these are the sort of questions that we are trying to raise in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. There are no records as to how these potters were able to make mm -hmm. these uh, traditional Korean ceramics. So, thank you for the, the yeah. yeah, okay, that's okay. You know, my question was came back as a question. So <laughs> I don't know what to say, but, but never mind, never mind, that's okay. I think you know we, we need so much time to talk about that. So maybe later. Sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. Those are the best responses. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of exhibitions, this is a theme that is important for these conference attendees and all of you as panelists, I think, to address. Um, because all of you have curated um, exhibitions, those of you on this panel. And we have a question from Sinead Vilbar about virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can be thinking about technologies for a moment here. She writes, these days, it seems many people are interested in VR or virtual reality experiences. Do you think recreating the historical tea room the chashitsu in VR could be an experience that would appeal to younger people in a museum context. Perhaps if all the younger people are not mm. purchasing tea bowls, it's up to museums to bring well, younger people uh, in and, and create appeal. Any can thoughts I, can on I, that? Can I talk about it? Can I talk Please. about it? <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think the experiencing is 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 okay, right? You know, you know, the first time in a tea room or such a small space, but I think the experiencing the 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 tea in a, in a real term is very different. And my friend um, tea master told me that you know, golf and tea ceremony is the same thing. That's what he says, because you know, once you um, Continue doing the practicing tea, and one and at, at one point, you know, you you your body just move as it should be without thinking, and that's the same thing as the goal ball is <laughs> and fly fly long. <laughs> it's, it's just it's the same thing. So the just practicing and making body it fit into this um this culture. It's, it's actually the same thing. So if the young people are really trying to learn how to do the tea ceremony, the virtual reality is a bit difficult still. If you can actually, the whole body, entire body can get into the space, then maybe a different story. That's, that's my opinion. Other thoughts on virtual reality? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what, uh... Uh, Professor Mayazaki Sensei just said, and uh, oftentimes we talk about uh, the importance of having a tea room in a museum setting because, you know, both tea rooms and tea bowls, uh, they have to be activated. So um, um, if you can like uh, demonstrate, you know, like tea practice in a museum setting, then that would be the best way to show. But at the same time, you know, like most of museum nowadays have a tea room, but when they're not activated, it sort of like becomes kind of like a neglected space. And like some audience might not have a clue what this is about. So I think it would be great to have a, you know, like, uh, you know, like Sine just suggested to have a sort of a video or virtual reality uh, 
you know, like to like show the way, but as uh, Shinya Maijaki sensei just address, it won't be the same experience at all. Mm -hmm. Yuji Akimoto sensei, any thoughts oh. on VR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is uh, yeah, virtual reality is uh, one of the uh, 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 the, I think the ex experience and uh, practice is the uh, very important uh, for uh, get a uh, art uh, uh, thing. So the yeah, virtual reality and uh, it's uh, one of the information. If I uh, when I gave uh, uh, to them and uh, people, yeah, people uh, that this is the first uh, step that people can um, get a knowledge of uh, art. What is a uh, tea or what is the art? And but uh, it's just the information. So the uh, the people have to get into the you know the real reality and uh, yeah uh, they have to have the experience directly through the art ceremony or uh, artwork uh, seeing the artworks yeah this is the very important thing yeah indeed okay. linda, linda thank you linda sakura writes in the comments mm -hmm. that in the class she teaches on common ground. This is a university-wide requirement for first-year students at Alfred. Uh, mm -hmm. Students have said in the section on virtual life, uh, the first-year students were opting for less time on or in the screen. Um, let's shift focus, if we might, to the question of the T itself, because uh, yesterday, one important point that came up was that a, a bowl that might have been used for tea could have been used uh, for other things. And when we're thinking about why the chawan is sustained in usage in Japan, it has to do with the, the shifts in tea drinking itself. Uh, in other parts of Asia. So Dr. Sang, could you speak a little bit about uh, shifts in tea consumption in Korea that uh, have to do with the longer history of tea bowl usage? And I'm, I'm, I'm following up to a, a, another question by Randall Weingarten. How did shifts in supply and demand for tea bowls vary with cultivation of tea itself. So I'm adding cultivation and popularity of tea, because as we know, the, the taste for uh, leaf green tea eclipsed the taste for powdered teas in China and Korea. So, uh, so the, relation, the relationship between uh, the tea itself and tea bowls, I would love to hear any further comments on, on that, or if anyone wants to speak to the fact that the word for tea bowl in Japanese, chawan is sometimes used to refer to a bowl for rice. That was a long, complicated kind of question, but <laughs> could you talk more about tea itself and its relation to some of the works that you discussed? So yeah, uh, in Korea times, uh, there was a variety of tea uh, imported from China and locally produced. And when we talk about the tea bowls, you know, the definition of tea bowls, it seems like there were no like specific sort of um, indication that certain types of bowls were made exclusively for serving tea because you know at this time tea was uh, in competition with different types of beverage you know such as alcohol and uh, it 
seems like at least uh, in Korean literature or key poetry, uh, there are no specific mention of uh, what table should look like, although there are indications that um, you know certain decorative motifs such as floral, floral flower designs were preferred, or you know how, um, some uh, tea practitioners will uh, appreciate you know the froth of the whipped tea and how it matches the color of celadon. So like what the tea is serving, the, the type of uh, tea bowl, the type of tea that the tea boy is serving really mattered and, but not like, not the shapes or the size of the tea bowl. So it's very hard to know and hard to come up with the, the definition of tea bowls. Uh, and there are various terms used, not exclusively, uh, Chawan, which is Taiwan in Korean. Um, so the the uh, whisk tea trend, uh, you know, like came, you know, like it, it reached its peak in the Goryeo Dynasty, but uh, but still, uh, you know. Goryeo tea practitioner will drink, you know, many different types of tea, and we don't know uh, how many. And uh, in the Joseon, in in the as entering uh, the Joseon dynasty, there were uh, various uh, foreign invasion, and after that, uh, it really left the the with tea culture on the brink. And so uh, many ritual tea, tea practitioner actually uh, prefer drinking steep tea instead of with tea uh, for uh, various reasons. So the, uh, the, the production of tea bowl uh, for serving uh, with tea sort of uh, kind of like decrease. Uh, at the end, uh, at the end of the Goryeo Dynasty and throughout the Joseon Dynasty. Thank you. And Ellen Averill asks a question following up to Bob Maury's presentation yesterday: Was the whisked tea consumed in Goryeo Celadon bowls a white tea, like in Song China, or was it something more like green matcha? Do we are there historical records that? Clarify. Oh, that's a great. Yeah, thank you so much for raising the question. Uh, the simple answer is we don't know, uh, but um, uh, we can find some clues. Uh, like certainly, uh, I learned a lot from Bob Maury's presentation yesterday, and true, uh, it was the same case in Korea because a lot of these teas were imported from China to Korea. And what was really popular in China was also very popular in Goryeo, Korea. So uh, it was the same case. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, references uh, in Goryeo uh, tea poetry that uh, whisk tea was served during the family ceremonies, but we don't really know whether it, it meant like mata or different types of tea. So uh, that's something that I like to uh, study more in the future. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Other thoughts on T, I know Maizaki Sensei, you've done a lot of uh, research and publication on Sencha. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk well, further about that? Um, I was just thinking like um, the color of tea bowls. Um, when the whisk, like opaque tea was drunk, then the, you know, the, the color of the bowl is, is quite important because, you know, it has to be a contradictory color, like, you know, red or black. Red and black is very important because it's 
green is, will be inside. It's like the, you know, the Son Yong was saying about, you know, if you put the tea ball in the a tea in the tea ball, then you know the the color of the bowl is very important. So when so then when the Japanese people started to drink sencha, like you know, steep tea, then they needed porcelain <laughs> because it's um you know translucent color. And then they don't want to see the, the color of the ball because, you know, it's very fade, you know, light color. So then the porcelain is important. So then, you know, the potters in Kyoto try to create the porcelain, you know, because, you know, importing Chinese stuff is expensive. So they, they try to make a copy. So, you know, I was just thinking about color and then, you know, the change of the trend. And, you know, then, then this shift happens about around 1800. Now, before 1800, you know, most of the people still drinking the whisked tea. But after the 1800, Japanese people started to drink the steep tea. And in the major period, most of the people were drinking steep tea, but somehow we say that we drink the whisked tea. <laughs> and it still continues. Now we are, we, we are coming, the tea is coming from here. Um, but we are still saying that we, we still drink whisked tea. And that's not really true. Uh, so. Uh, that's a funny <laughs> cultural uh, thing. And I, well, one, one more thing that in the major period, um, Japanese, the Japanese people actually um, import, uh, asked, uh, how can I say, asked Chinese specialists to come to Japan to plant the tea leaves uh, uh, in order to create not the green tea, the black tea. Uh, Japanese government uh, tried to create the black tea but they they got the specialist from China, so you know you're just thinking about all these uh, mixture of things, and people don't talk about that. <laughs> but if you go through, I mean, I was I was looking at the foreign you know foreign workers ca came to Japan, but there's so many Chinese people came to Japan to work in Japanese farm, growing tea trees. So you know just looking at all these news or you know untold stuff, um, the the history will be very different. Uh, especially about the tea, but it's not translated into English. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe you'll, maybe, maybe you'll do that. Uh, uh, yes, I'll try. <laughs> Akimoto Sensei, any any further thoughts on tea before we move on? Oh, uh, as my Sensei mentioned about uh, the population of uh, tea lovers. Uh, decreasing recently. This is uh, very true. But uh, I, uh, uh, my point of view is uh, optimistic. And uh, this is the uh, bottom of the, you know, the numbers. And the new uh, generation uh, who, uh, who is a uh, uh, owner of the company. Uh, this is a uh, they are young uh, uh, owner of the company. He are interested in the uh, art and uh, uh, tea ceremony rather than you know the golf. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they want to shift the uh, interest. Yeah, and uh, this is the yeah. It's not uh, uh, many uh, many numbers. Uh, but uh, it's uh, getting, uh, I think, uh, increasing. And uh, so that uh, uh, I uh, organize many events about uh, uh, craft and uh, tea ceremony in Hokuriku area. And uh, uh, they come and enjoy the tea ceremony to discover the new, you know, the new culture. Yeah. Yeah, this is a new tendency, and uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm following up on that. Uh, I think there's a question about the Yoshida Takuro's tea ball, and then uh, my friend tea master, uh, I actually using. Uh, I just sent the, um, the the links, so if you go there, um, Yoshida Takuro's tea ball is actually used by the tea masters. <laughs> Please have a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good news. <laughs> news. <laughs> Thank you. There's another great question by Ai Fukunaga in the Q&A that relates to gender. And gender is, is a, a topic of questions that have come to me over the course of curating this exhibition. And I'm often asks, asked, who are the women artists in the exhibition? Uh, so today, 
uh, Professor Akimoto, you showed uh, works by Muta Yoko uh, that are important when we're thinking about the 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 um, overlap between contemporary artists' interests and the world of Chanoyu. Mm -hmm. uh, Ai Fukunaga asks, do you think any possibilities to revive tea culture by being more inclusive? I felt that heavily relying on rich male communities is not sustainable and seems problematic uh, from a gender point of view. Uh, as you showed us, female communities are in fact the dominant population of practicing tea. So would each of you want to comment on women as tea bowl makers, and also women as tea ceremony practitioners, and the question of inclusivity and sustainability and gender in general. <laughs> a big question. It's a big uh, question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, let me talk about the tea bowl makers. Um, they are more male um, makers. The, partly and why is because that? I think, partly because I think because um, 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 they are like you know something something fifteenth. You know, <laughs> the, the always the lineage of you know tea bowl makers like Raku, right? And then you know they are haven't chosen any uh, female um, head of the family. But it probably changed because then my friend there, uh, Sua Sozan, um, he, um, there's a family uh, can take actually um, the female as a head. So the current head, she is the fifth generation, but she's a female. So I think it's changing because now the Japan, the people who is doing ceramics or uh, Kogei, you know, in the Kogei, there are more women uh, learning. Um, probably, you know, probably half and a half when we talk about the artist, all the artists, or, you know, the, the people who became artists, maybe half men, half women, and about the up even numbers uh, now working. But in, in terms of Chawan, I think the more men making at the moment, but probably change. I don't know. I can say maybe have a different opinion, but um yeah, it, the, yeah. the older generation yeah yeah the the male uh, the man uh, creates the uh, tea ball yeah in the yeah in the old men but uh, the i think the younger generation yeah it came uh, just show up uh, as a, a, a tea ball maker uh, the most of not the most of all but uh, 60 percent and the uh, 70 uh, percent female yeah the, i think yeah <laughs> it, when i when i go to uh, art school and uh, yeah, if, if you go to art school but if yeah. you're talking about the independent potter who are kind uh, of being a yeah, uh, potter and uh, living uh, artist then probably uh, like you know not that many to me yet. yeah not, not but many. i think it's changing we're thinking about the yeah. university and all these students uh, the average is like you know 90 mm. female 10 male you know at the moment especially yeah. the kyoto uh, university bots yeah. and so it, it will change soon yeah it's it's now changing yeah we can find the female uh, maker yeah so the i think uh, yeah uh, uh, when I show the uh, artist in this time, uh, the half percent are female. So the, the young artists are yeah, female, yeah. Dr. Sang, do you, do you have any um, sure, insights um, into maybe Goryeo dynasty? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, so little is known about uh, the female tea practitioners. Uh, of the Goryeo dynasty and certainly tea drinking was an elite uh, male uh, sort of pastime hobby and 
but we do have records that the royal family uh, was the great patron of tea drinking. And uh, so it's not hard to imagine that uh, the royal family and the court ladies would have enjoyed and have access to uh, tea rituals during this time, but that's something that I also will also like to learn more in the future. And I was thinking also like, you know, like when I think about uh, Japan, you know, I was also thinking about the uh, Iemoto system, you know, like the traditional ceramic workshop. Uh, most of the time I find that the head of, you know, certain ceramic workshop there, you know, like, male, you know, like son, you know, like adopted son either. And I, I think I, I recently learned that uh, the new uh, head of the huggy wear is a female. So I don't know if it's changing or not, but yes. Can I, can I say about that? The, uh, the, the, the traditionally uh, Japanese uh, potter's uh, family, uh, you know, male dominant. It's, it's partly because um, Japanese fire god is female and they don't like the, the people and uh, women coming around the kiln. So a female won't really allow to fire ceramics traditionally. It's until very recently, about maybe 30, 40 years ago. I mean, my friend, the Saki-san, the, um, um, the granddaughter of uh, Kawai Kanjiro told me that uh, she, she wasn't allowed to go any close to the go come close to the kiln. So only the male could fire the kiln. So that was the main reason why, you know, they're always the men uh, firing the tea pot <laughs> or the tea bowl. Indeed, Matsuda Yuriko, a prominent ceramic artist, well-known in and outside of, of Japan, uh, has, has shared uh, with many people, the fact that Tomimoto Kenkichi at first was reluctant to teach how to fire kilns to students, but she persisted mm -hmm. and uh, did receive an education in firing tea bowls. Uh, there's so much we could we could discuss regarding this important issue. We've got four minutes left. <laughs> Where do we want to go from here? Uh, I know it's very late where all of you are. Uh, yes. We had a question earlier about the naming of tea bowls. Perhaps that's a topic we can end on. To name a tea bowl. Does, did this practice exist at all in the Gordio dynasty? How important is naming tea bowls to contemporary artists? Um, how does naming tea bowls figure into this vast history, Maizaki Sensei, that you <laughs> took us on a journey through <laughs> to name tea bowls? In our exhibition, we only mm. have a few named tea bowls. One is by a 20th century Raku potter, and he named it Sep Bowl or Snowy Peak. I think partially in reference to Koetsu's famous tea bowl called Sep Bowl. Uh, another is named Eboshi, and I believe Dr. Maskey will be talking with us more about that name uh, in a few moments. But any thoughts on naming? Um, Meg, okay. Megan? Oh, I can listen, say. Meg? Oh. oh. Andrew Maskey, <laughs> yeah, please so. chime in. Oh, 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 Andrew Maskey. And let's, let's get you on screen. Okay. Oh, that's... Uh, since you bring up the... the um, the topic of naming tea bowls. Um, I could jump in here as I've done a little bit of research on that. Uh, in the 16th century, the names of tea bowls were usually, and, and other tea utensils too, were, were um, came from um, previous owners. So a famous one is the Kizayemon tea bowl. Mm -hmm. um, so it got that name from a particular owner at one point. Um, it was really in the 17th century that the poetic names became more common. Um, there are a few from the time of BQ, um, but it's really um, around the uh, 1620s or 1630s that uh, the tea master Kobori Enshu 
really made that uh, a, a big thing um, because he was very much involved with the uh, poetry of the Heian period. And so many of the names of um, the poetic names of tea utensils, including tea bowls, uh, come from uh, Heian period waka, things like the Ise Monogatari, for example. Um, so that's a little bit of the uh, influence of um, poetry on the naming of, of uh, tea utensils and tea bowls. Thank you. Uh, other panelists, any quick thoughts? Because we all need a tea break. Um, um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, if you if you are a tea master and then having a um, tea ceremony, then you know the the name some some sometimes um, disturbs <laughs> the the setting, right? So um, I'm working with many um, crafts uh, you know, artists, and um, they many of them not really like to put you know, very specific names because you know, that actually limits the possibility of the ways. And so I think it's, so I think probably, you know, people in the past probably thought the same way, but still, you know, there are people who, who wanted to put the name. So it, it, I think it depends on the people who make them, not the, not the, uh, the, the use them, not the making them is, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, just briefly talking about this practice of naming tea bowls. So naming tea bowls means that these tea bowls are indispensable. They cannot be replaced, but it's on its own. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there was sort of same practice in Korea. And also I think this concept of you know, sort of like led into this practice of repairing uh, tea bowls because even though it's broken or it's in bad shape, still you will repair because you will treasure these tea bowls so much that you will not throw them away. But uh, in Korea, I, I, you know, like I'm not sure if there was a similar practice, especially during the Korean period. Uh, and that's something that I like to work on. Is it like unique to Japan or was there any other practice? similar in other parts of East Asia. That's it. Mm -hmm. Akimoto-sensei, final thoughts. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the naming, naming tea ball is a very interesting uh, uh, issue uh, talking about uh, uh, tea ceremony and the tea culture. The, the creation is uh, 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 always uh, 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 comes from uh, creator, artist, uh, we believe that. But the, the look at the tea a, a ceremony, tea, tea history, uh, the, uh, the owner of the uh, artworks and the producer of the artworks uh, uh, participated to the create something and uh, they put their own original original idea into the artwork. Uh, so the exchanging the you know the concept between a, a maker and a user. This is a very uh, interesting uh, you know the exchanging uh, uh, culture. Yeah, I think yeah. Indeed, lots to continue to think about. And uh, I thank you all so much for staying up late and presenting such stimulating uh, presentations and engaging in our dialogue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna pause for a tea break until 10.30 and we'll return at 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. And we'll hear presentations from Dr. Andrew Maskey and Dr. Natsu Oyobe. See you then.